Welcome, you're watching Managing Day-to-Day -Day with me, Christina Laster, and National Parents Union. Always a pleasure supporting you across the nation, parents, caretakers, and families. I'm honored to be here. Um, and so, you know, I hope that you're all being safe and being well amid all of the confusion, amid all of the questions surrounding the rises in COVID and all of those things, but I want you to be mentally well, um, spiritually, I'm a faith-based person, spiritually well, um, and eat well, you know, so that we can all thrive. Hello to America's beautiful children. We love you. I'm so glad that we're making it. We're managing moment by moment, day by day. And so I have a special guest today. I'm always just honored with the guests that I'm able to bring on to disseminate uh, valuable information in a timely manner. Um, and today I have Tim Adams from Adams and Associates. Hello, Tim. Unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> That's right. Unmute. Hello. That's okay. We we manage moment by moment, day by day on managing day to day with the National Parents Union. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So glad to have you. Um, you know, can you tell all of our national viewers who you are and what you do and where you're at? Sure. My name is Tim Adams. I'm a special education attorney. I've been in law practice in California for about almost 20 years and um, coming up on my 20th year. And, you know, I represent families uh, of, and children who are impacted by a variety of dis disabilities who are eligible for special education or 504 plans, uh, or just need support with uh, a local in California called the Regional Center, uh, if you have a developmental disability. Uh, right. but the vast majority of my practice focuses on special education. You know, and that's so timely. We we experienced this crisis with the pandemic. Um, prior to that, my experience has been that the IEPs were not implemented very well. Um, and now here you have school closures and this big crisis and IEPs are still not it, it being implemented up in the air. Parents are really trying to hold on to something, what do you do, right? Um, and so if you could give just some information about what us parents should be looking for with regards to IEP implementation, that would be great. Sure. So every, every child has a right to an IEP and every, who's eligible for an IEP. Every child who is eligible for an IEP has a right to have their IEP implemented, whether it's a distance learning context or a brick and mortar. So the, the child and the parent, um, you know, they're, they're working with the school district, they're working with the public agency, and the public agency's responsibility is to ensure that if the school district switches to a distance learning context, and we just saw this as recent as Friday, where the governor announced that for most counties in California, uh, most of the populous counties, that schools are going to be in a distance learning format again. So we experienced that in March, from March to the end uh, of June until the end of last school year. And now we're seeing that that's happening again. The difference between the spring and now is that um, on June 29th, uh, the California State Senate, and this is California specific, we can talk about the country as a whole, but I'll start with California. The California State Senate passed Senate Bill 98, and it ensures that um, the education code is modified to uh, so, so that IEPs can be implemented even in a distance learning context. And it's very clear that that should happen. So uh, there's, a, there's, a very, uh, there's a very specific language that requires that, that services in an IEP be implemented, whether they're, they're you know, in a distance learning format or whether they're, uh, they're in a brick and mortar uh, context. Now, that's always been the case under federal law. In fact, we heard from uh, the US Department of Education in April that IEPs are still, still supposed to be implemented. So we had a lot of school districts very, and, and public schools in general, very confused about what their obligations were, but ultimately the law hasn't changed. So what right. California recently did is they simply codified it so it was clear but federal law, um, based on direction we had from the U.S. Department of Education, has always been the same. If it's distance learning, the IEP has to be implemented. If it's, if it's brick and mortar and you're, you're going physically to school, it still has to be implemented. 
So really, it's the school districts that have to catch up. And unfortunately, it's going to take some time as a result of, uh, of a lot of confusion and, and I would say sort of a moving target of rules. Um, school districts have, uh, have been confused themselves, but they've also disseminated information to families that is, is, is not clear as to what the school district may be doing to provide instruction, to provide services outlined in IEP. And so even with regards to parents that are looking over their IEP, looking at the services and supports, it could be from speech therapy to occupational therapy, a whole host of things, right? We have students that are um, autistic that need devices, uh, all kinds of stuff. What types of things should they be um, doing to, in order to get those services provided, right? So we have this mandate, which was pretty much the mandate before anyway, with regards to IEPs, but now we have a clearer set of, of directions um, with regards to what is expected from schools. Uh, systems, um, but yet parents still aren't receiving their services and support. So moving forward, what should they be doing to make sure that their IEP is implemented? Well, first and foremost, they need to, to make sure that they're getting all the correspondence letters and emails, uh, if they're using email letters, um, if they're not, from the school district. So we, we know what the school district's position is. What is the school district going to be doing? Most school districts in California effective last Friday as a result of the governor's new order are going to be virtual. They're going to be a distance learning. Um, so we need to understand, you know, ask the school district, given that the governor has announced um, in California specifically that, that my school is going to be distance learning, what services is the district proposing to provide here are my, here's my IEP, what can I expect? It's a simple question that you would make, you would put in writing. My, my recommendation is always to put it in writing and keep track of what the school district is doing uh, and make sure you've got a clear understanding of what your requests are and what their responses are. You know, and parents I, and caretakers and families, I have to say, pull the IEP out, look through the goals, look through every area Find out what you are supposed to be receiving for that to meet that goal um, and ask about every single one. How are, we, how are you going to provide services and supports to meet this goal? If you have 10 goals, ask, right? Um, but there's a group of parents also that were in the process of, of um, requesting an IEP uh, and assessments. Um, and when the school closures came, that just totally put it to a halt, even though I don't think it should have. They should have been priority and, and should have been responded to. What do those parents do? Okay. So for the students that weren't already eligible for an IEP under a set, well, at least in California, and I can speak to that and then we can go broader. Um, I, I, I can talk specifically to California law there are going to be state specific nuances. So states can pass their own laws. They just can't take away rights that students have under federal law. So keep that in mind. Federal law still controls, it always has. No, nothing has changed in terms of your rights under federal law. Congress has to, would have to make that change and Congress hasn't made any changes. Um, if they do in the future, then, then we'll, we'll know and we can talk about what those changes are. But right now it's the same. But under, under California law, if, if it was an assessment plan or an assessment that was requested under Senate Bill 117, the school district had um, an extension of time to present that assessment plan. Now, there's arguably a conflict between that and what federal law says, because federal law says the, the school districts still have to assess every student that they suspect may have a disability. So you've got this California law that says they have an extension of time to provide this assessment plan, this consent form, and you've got federal law that says they still need to assess. So, you know, California school districts, most of them follow this, this Senate Bill 117 and said we have an extension of time. And so many of the school districts, when the parents were in the midst of asking for an assessment for their child, they put it on hold and they may have responded if they did at all, some districts didn't respond and said, we're going to get back to you later after the school year at, at the beginning of next school year because under senate bill 117 we have an extension of time now in my opinion that violates federal law 
Um, so I think California overstepped by saying they didn't have to prepare an assessment consent form, and we call it an assessment plan. Um, so I would encourage those families in California and you know, out of the state to make a written request for an assessment. It's always best to make that written request. And you can do it by email, you can do it by letter, uh, and then keep a copy if you do it by a letter. Um, so you've got, you've got a record of what you requested. Right. And so, you know, there has to be a trail of what you did request um, and what was the response. Um, parents and families and caretakers, if you didn't receive a response, you know, mark that on your calendar. There are time frame guidelines um, by which these things are supposed to be taking place. And so, Tim, we talk about the federal protection, um, but not every parent understands what that means. Can you explain what that means? So... So there are procedural guidelines, meaning it's there, there are certain procedures that school districts across the country have to follow. And in California, we call them procedural safeguards. And under, under the federal law, the parent is, is entitled to get a copy of their procedural safeguards. Um, they've got to get a copy at an IEP meeting, an annual IEP meeting. They have to receive a copy of these procedural safeguards or the procedural rights when a district does an assessment. Um, and I'm using the district loosely. It could mean public charter schools as well, but I'm going to use the word district throughout this discussion. Um, or um, that procedural safeguard could be or would be posted on uh, the, the school district uh, or the public charter's website. So ultimately, that outlines your rights. And that's really what the federal law says in most cases. Now, school districts, I would encourage you to, 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 to ask questions if you think that your rights are being violated or if you think that something that's been provided to you isn't accurate. But an example of a procedural right, when a parent makes a request for a service or a program and the district says no, they have to send a written, uh, written explanation as to why it's a no. So we call it prior written notice. And that prior written notice letter has to go out within a reasonable period of time from the parent's request. There's not a specific timeline for that to happen. It's just a reasonable time. But generally, we see school districts respond within 30 to 45 days, um, saying all the reasons why they decline. Now, if they, if they don't send that notice, that's a procedural problem, meaning your rights have been violated if you don't get a response as to what you've asked for. So whether it's an assessment for your child, whether it's a change in services, whether it's an explanation as to what the district is, is doing during a distance learning environment or context, you know, if it's been announced that it's going to be distance learning in your school district, then the, the, the district has an obligation to send prior written notice to explain how does this impact your child specifically? Not just everybody, they can send a notice saying, well, everybody's gonna go distance learning and your IEP will be implemented. Well, what does that mean, especially for a student that's receiving uh, physical in-person services or that they were receiving those services before the COVID closures. The, the district has to go into more detail and explain what that means as to that student specifically, not just a broad letter, dear parents, um, that it needs to be more specific, right? Right, right. And, and, and that's pretty much, I laugh because that's pretty much what we've been getting. Um, and just hearing from the parents, here is one thing that I know there's something wrong with, right? Um, parents are telling me that in order for them to get what they need, they need a doctor's note. First of all, saying that there's something wrong with their, their child um, that would qualify as a disability. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking, well, isn't that the purpose of the assessments? So sure. that's a kind of murky area. Um, yes, I know that um, federal law protects disabled people, but we're talking about children who, if you suspect, may have a learning disability, you want them to be assessed. Um, can you kind of clarify, should they have to have a doctor's note or can they just write, um, I believe that my child has a learning disability or some type of disability um, to request either an IEP or whatever they may need an right. assessment? That's a really good question, Christina. So no, the doctor's note is not required. Is it helpful? It is helpful because you're getting insight from a medical professional as to what the needs are. But anyone who knows the child can request that the child be evaluated for special education. So the, the words that would, you'd wanna use, and we wanna put these in writing, just like we put other requests in writing, a parent would write a letter to the school district saying, I have concerns about my child 
because of, and, and they can describe what those concerns are. He's having difficulty maintaining attention. Um, we're seeing some, some behaviors at home that we haven't seen before. His frustration tolerance is really low. Uh, you know, he's not completing all his homework assignments. Um, he's overwhelmed. There's a lot of descriptive terms that, that a parent can use in a letter in writing that would trigger the school district's responsibility. And in addition, in that letter, you would specifically say, I believe my child may qualify for a special education. And I'm asking the district to complete an evaluation. So those are, those are the words you want to use. And you can send that letter. Like I said, it's helpful if you do have a, a, a medical professional that can offer some additional insight from their perspective, but it's not legally required. Right. And then I have a whole group of parents that do have a doctor's note and are still being denied the assessment. So um, I would recommend that um, you parents follow up with that. Like, like Tim said, you should be receiving a notice um, that you sign, you know, giving, granting permission for them to go ahead and follow, go with the assessment. What do we do about our annuals? You know, our annual um, reassessments. Um, some people were waiting for their 504 addendum meetings. I mean, this is a mess, you know. Um, what do we do about that? Well, you need to you need to follow up with the school district to find out what they're planning to when they're planning to schedule these meetings or reschedule these meetings. Um, in many cases, I have clients who uh, where the school district is is four months, five months, six months behind uh, because they got cut up in the closures and we're in a holding pattern trying to decide what to do next. So going back to what I said, federal law never changed. The school districts always had the same obligations. So every one of the school districts is out of compliance. They were supposed to have that annual IEP. They were supposed to complete that triennial assessment. They were, if, for a parent who signed an assessment consent form, they were supposed to finish that assessment process within 60 days and have an IEP meeting. And in many cases that hasn't happened. So every one of those parents has a claim um, for what should have happened before. And that could result in a parent or a child in this case being entitled to what's called compensatory education for services that may have been provided had the district finished the assessment at time or had the IEP. Uh, many students could have benefited from services offered much earlier, but as a result of the school district not completing that IEP or completing that assessment, the services weren't offered. So, you know, maybe the student is entitled to, you know, 40 hours of speech and language therapy on an individual basis. Maybe the student's entitled to um, some, some tutoring services to provide instruction and remediation in math uh, or English language arts or something like that. So there's a compensatory education can take a variety of forms. And so essentially think of it as makeup services. What makeup services is that student entitled to because the school district didn't meet its procedural obligations? Right, and the guidelines are um, set forth by the federal government as well as far as um, compensatory education, right? Right, so, so we're, looking at, we're looking at case law to determine, and when I say case law, courts have decided sort of an analysis of what, what a student's entitled to, but it's also been codified, and it's based on the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and what we call the Implementing Regulations, okay, which the U.S. Department of Education um, issues that receive public comment and ultimately, uh, you know, are, are act as law, essentially, um, in addition to the IDA. So it's implementing regulations of the IDA, and that can be found in what we call Title 34. Of so, the parents, Code of regulations. so parents, you know, um, I know this is a lot um, of information to process, but I know that m most of you that have children with IEPs are feeling overwhelmed by the fact that you don't know where your child's impl IEP implementation is headed. Um, you have no idea what you're gonna do um, with regards to educating from home. You might not feel like you have all of the supports that you need. This needs to be requested in writing. I'd say do it today, you know? Um, send that letter. Um, how is my child's IEP implementation going to look for the upcoming distance learning um, protocols that you guys are having, right? What is the district prepared to do to fully implement my child's IEP? And 
are you prepared to compensate them for the time and education that they lost during um, you know, school closure where the IEP was not correctly implemented? Um, how can people find you, Tim, for more information? So, so I, I have a website, uh, CaliforniaSpecialEdLaw.com or EdAttorneys.com. Um, and both of those are available. And I don't know if you have the ability to provide those, but um, you can certainly uh, send that out to your, to your viewership and, and they can see. But it's uh, easy to find me, uh, Tim Adams, uh, as a special education attorney. And um, I'm happy to talk to anyone who has questions about their rights. And um, I'm guiding parents daily on what to do, especially in these, uh, in these uncertain times. And, you know, you have a newsletter, which I received. Thank you for that wonderful newsletter. Um, are parents able to email you and request that newsletter? Absolutely. So on our website, you can ask to be, to be added to our newsletter if you'd like. So you don't have to be a client. Um, you can all, also email us directly if you have, if you'd like to be added. Uh, we've been sending more newsletters out, um, especially since we've seen a, a lot more uh, changes in the law um, in our state and you know again federal law hasn't changed but there's been a lot of factual you know new situations that we've had to deal with as a result of the COVID closures so applying what exists as the law to the factual situation my school's open my school's closed what do I do next um, we try to create what are what we call frequently asked questions or FAQ and and send that out to families once we've had you know, had some feedback from families as to what the questions are. And, you know, I just want to reiterate and be very clear um, to the viewers, um, especially those parents that have been struggling for years to get their children's IEPs implemented correctly. This is not a new problem. Doing IEP implementation correctly during school closure, however, is a new situation. Um, and so I want to make sure that moving forward, we continue to unrelentingly push for what is right and what is supposed to take place within the realm of special education. At the same time, you know, and you've said this, you can't change their behavior, but you can change yours. Like, how am I going to look at this in a way that I can help my child best? Because this isn't a new problem. I work for special education for seven years. And the same thing I'm seeing 20 some odd years later um, are what was taking place back then. And so the solution is not like, oh, okay, if we hurry up and get the kids back in school, their IEPs will be implemented. No, that is not uh, what typically has, has taken place. Um, and so this is something that looking at how to really do education needs to be addressed correctly, but it's gonna take each of us parents um, understanding our right, knowing what it is that we're supposed to be requesting, what does that escalation process look like, um, and really battling and advocating for that. I um, eventually decided to do a private school affidavit, homeschool my children, and then I found a public charter school that has a homeschool program and my children are doing good with their IEP implementation 504. But that's not the case for everyone. And so we have to be willing to say, what can we do that is gonna be best for the outcomes of our students so that they thrive? If you have any um, suggestions before we close, Tim, I would definitely, want those viewers, our parents, our caretakers, our families to hear your final thoughts on that. Absolutely. So my suggestions, my recommendations to families is always to, to take action. Don't depend on your public school to do it for you. As a parent, you have to take the reins and you have to make decisions uh, about what you believe is best for your child. Now, the school district has an obligation under the law to provide appropriate services and they may tell you they don't have to provide the best, but you're going to shoot for the best and you're going to call it appropriate. Okay, so that's as a, as a parent, you, you have to really be the spearhead um, that, that moves that process along because the school district, regardless of their obligations under the law, they're not necessarily going to take action that's in the best interest of your child. You're going to have to do it as the parent. 
Again, uh, you've been watching Managing Day to Day with me, Christina Laster, and National Parents Union. Thank you so much, Tim, for coming and bringing your expertise. Um, I know that this is a lot. If you have any questions or need information, you can contact me, Christina at mpunion.org. I will be putting um, Tim information that he shared in the uh, video chat area where you can go back and you'll see that pop up. Um, we want you to know your rights. We want all of your children to thrive. And Tim, thank you so much. You're very thank welcome. You so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I appreciate it. So parents, again, um, I hope you're all well. I will see you again on Thursday, same time, watching Managing Day to Day with me, Christina Laster, National Parents Union. Goodbye, America's beautiful children. We love you, and we will see you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.